material. The first few days we, we talked about um, historical papers, so probably for about the first four lectures. We looked at uh, this, this seminal work by Mola, uh, linking macromolecular composition and growth rate. Uh, we looked at this seminal work by Neidhart and Makisanik that, that rationalized uh, this, this linear correlation between the RNA to protein ratio and the growth rate by saying that ribosomes are catalytic in protein synthesis. Right, again, that, that wasn't obvious, but it took a little bit of unpacking, and we, we got to the bottom of that. And then finally, we spent two days looking at uh, Cooper and Helmstetter's rules or, or experiments plus rules on DNA replication in bacteria, particularly DNA replication in E. coli. Uh, and this, this is, I mean, took a lot of jumps, a little, lot of baby steps to arrive at the idea that to replicate the chromosome, so E. coli, remember, has DNA stored in a circle, to replicate, the chromosome takes 40 minutes and then 20 more minutes to se separate it and, and divide the cell. Which means that if you want to, or if the cell wants to double faster than 60 minutes, it needs to initiate or somehow speed up that process. And the way it does that is by initiating parallel rounds of DNA replication. So it still has one chromosome, but it's, it's got several replication forks running at the same time. All right, and so that's what we talked about probably in Thursday's lecture. And then Friday, we move to, to present day. And the, uh, the main sort of focus of what, what we were talking about in the present day was this proteome partitioning constraint. So we said, all right, in, in the 1960s, Neidhart and Magasonic got this part, that when the growth rate goes up, well, the ribosome fraction needs to go up as well. But what wasn't recognized at the time and what we recognize now is that if you make more of some fraction of protein, in this case, ribosomal proteins, so this is ribosome protein fraction. This is you know, ribosomal proteins to total protein. If you make more of that fraction, you necessarily need to make less of other things. I mean, you, can't, you can't do it any other way. It's a pie chart. You make a bigger piece of pie, you need to make smaller pieces of pie. And what we're going to talk about today and tomorrow is the implications of this pie chart. So one, one thing that we saw was that if you had an unregulated protein, that's something that you need to make smaller. So when the ribosome fraction goes up, either by increasing the growth rate or decreasing the translation rate or the protein synthesis rate per ribosome, this unregulated protein does the opposite. It's pulled along for the ride. So whatever the regulation is to set this little flipper the P protein does the opposite of what the R protein does. Okay, that's what these two experiments were showing us. Well, two sets of experiments. All right, and then at the, what I suggested is that this isn't the whole story. If we calculate how many proteins or what mass fraction does this and what mass fraction does this, we still have 50% left over. And that 50% that's left over is growth rate independent. And we can, we can well ask, you know, what is that? And if we do proteomic uh, experiments and go in and check what is in this growth rate independent fraction, what we find is that any proteins that are in PNR have a small offset in the growth rate. And so they have some part of their expression which is growth rate independent and some part which is growth rate dependent. And so these are the sums of all the DC offsets, if you like, in these proteins. So they're not new proteins. They're the same as the ones that are here. It's just that half of it is growth rate independent and half of it is growth rate dependent and growth rate dependent in that seesaw way. All right. Um, so that was, that was, let me see, probably the first of Friday's lectures. Uh, and then we went downward and we said, what could be, what, what, how can we interpret these experiments in a self-consistent way? And this is, what's sometimes called an inverse problem. And it's, uh, it's not well defined. It, I mean, it's not, it's, it, it's, you have to be careful with these things. So what I suggested is that one way to rationalize all of this data, well, not the proteome partitioning constraint so much, but at least these two pieces of data, is to imagine the ribosomes as being responsible for protein synthesis with some rate per ribosome of incorporation of amino acids. 
And then at these non-ribosomal proteins, these so-called metabolic proteins, are responsible for nutrient assimilation, turning whatever's out in the environment into amino acids in order to be incorporated into proteins. And it, the, the reason that I say we, we need to be careful with this, so I opened the window because it was stuffy, but now it's too loud, so I'll just shut it. All right. <laughs> so the, uh, the reason that I say that we need to be careful about this is it's nice that it gives us a mental scaffolding about what's going on, but we can't fall in love with this interpretation because there's no guarantee that it's the unique solution that will give rise to these uh, phenomenological or higher order relationships. All right, it gives us a sense of how we might fiddle with these parameters, kappa T and kappa N, but it's by no means the, the only way that you could describe these, this data. So it's like in thermodynamics, you have some pressure, some volume, some temperature. The microstate could be you know, one of uncountably many different scenarios that give you the same pressure, volume, and temperature. Okay? Um, so I put this up there as a way to, to think about this. But I, I don't want it to become, uh, definitely don't take it as gospel. Don't take it as truth. It's plausible. Okay, these empirical constraints are much more important because they're much more reliable. They don't require any inference. And so what I want to talk about today is instead of this inverse problem, which we ended with last week, is a forward problem. And ask, given that these are our empirical constraints, what can we, what can we use them for? For example, and I'll, I'll go through a couple here, what are the consequences for uh, coupling between protein expression and growth rate expression and growth rate? And I'll be more, bless you, uh, more specific as, uh, you know, in a moment. Uh, another set of consequences that I want to talk about, and this will probably be our last example, which we'll get to either later today or definitely tomorrow, is antibiotic susceptibility. So consequences for antibiotic treatment. Okay, and as I say, this is a forward problem and it's much more reliable. <laughs> where we use these empirical constraints and we ask, what are the consequences? Okay, so in a whirlwind, that's what we talked about um, on, well, the, the twilight of last class, or the last round of lectures. Um, so a couple of people asked if we could clarify the meaning of this parameter, and so maybe I'll do that for a moment, and maybe clarify the, that uh, electrical circuit analogy that we used at the end of last lecture. But before I do that, let me pause. Are there any other points of clarification that people would like? Or any questions that linger from last week? Is that okay? Okay, so um, I'm going to come at this. this um, let's go backwards here and uh, look at some what are sometimes called loose ends. Okay, and the first was, uh, what is this kappa n parameter? And so we had at the beginning of last week this interpretation that this kappa t parameter had something to do with protein synthesis. So here we had... And then I suggested that this guy had something to do with the nutrient quality. But that's a very um, qualitative assessment. <clears throat> and so the, the uh, suggestion or the... the argument at the end of Friday's lecture was that what we mean by this is that it's a proportionality constant 
between the growth rate and the non-ribosomal protein fraction. So if we now if we now assume that or we now have that proteomic constraint, I'm going to write this up and then let's talk about it. That this phi max is equal to this phi p plus phi r. And here I'm, I'm subtracting off the, uh, the min, if you like. Let me show you what I mean in a second. So again, this constraint looks like this. Phi max, which is about 0 0.5 let me put an about equal to, is the sum of these two fractions. Phi r minus phi r min, which I call, well, I'll just leave it like that, plus phi p. So what I mean here is that there's, there's some constraint in the growth dependent fractions here. So I've subtracted off from r the growth independent fraction. And the sum of these two sectors has to be equal to 0 0.5 or some constant. Okay, let me pause. So that, that's everything on the table. And then let me talk about this kappa n in a moment, though. Is that okay in terms of the meaning of all the pieces? Does anybody have any questions about the notation? So this I variously called delta phi r, delta phi p just to denote them as, as uh, growth dependent. OK, so if we have this constraint, then I can take this second equation, okay, substitute into the second growth law, this growth law. And what I'll end up with is this, um, now what? Phi max minus phi p is equal to, so this is now, uh, so I'm going to have to do the algebra in my head. It'll take a second. So I'll have phi r minus phi r max is equal to negative lambda over kappa n. Sorry, not phi r minus phi r minus. Yes, sir. Yeah, bless you. Okay, so that's this guy. And now phi max is equal to phi r max minus phi r min, which is what I'm, I'm, I've sort of assumed. There's a lot of maxes and mins, and let's talk about them in a second. Then finally, what do I end up with? This is then going to be equal to, so phi r is phi max um, plus phi r min. <laughs> so I, here I'm solving for phi p. A phi plus minus phi r. Wait, what the heck am I doing here? Sorry. Minus phi p. Minus phi r max. Okay, so this guy is phi r. Okay, I promise you I'm getting somewhere with this. I mean, it, won't, it doesn't look like it yet. This is phi r max. And so these two sum together give me, or sorry, the difference of this guy and this guy give me that. And so they cancel. So this is now going to be equal to phi max minus phi r max minus phi r min minus phi p is equal to negative lambda kappa n. All right, this is the last step. So these cancel, and I'm left with lambda is kappa n 
phi p. And so what I'm suggesting is that there are two things that are driving growth rate in this cell. One is the synthesis of protein. And one is the supply of amino acids to feed that protein. And in balanced growth, we need a balance of these fluxes. Consumption of amino acid into protein synthesis, yes. But also supply of amino acids to feed that protein synthesis. And so one interpretation of this constraint is that kappa n is a proportionality constant that tells you how good these proteins are at supplying amino acids. If kappa n is very high, then you need very few proteins in order to maintain a high rate of protein supply or amino acid supply. If kappa n is low, then that tells you that you need many proteins to maintain this, uh, this amino acid supply. Okay, and that may be because your proteins are bad at what they do, or it may be because your environment is very, very difficult to metabolize. So you need many proteins to break them down and then build up amino acids, whatever the case may be. The point here is that one rationalization of this kappa n then, given this proteome constraint, is that it's a proportionality between non-ribosomal proteins and growth rate. Okay, now let me pause. So that was, that was an orthogonal way or say a complementary way of, of talking about what we talked about on Friday. So on Friday what we did was wrote out explicitly the amino acid supply and demand or supply and consumption if you will. And then we, we made some sort of ad hoc or I made some ad hoc Assumptions about that supply rate being related to the external antibiotic or external amino acid concentration and so on. And then argued that if the transporter was constitutively expressed, then you would get something like this. So that may have been uh, unsatisfactory to you. And if it was, that's, that's fine. Just throw it away. The most important part here is that there are two things that are making the growth rate. So we have a balanced situation. And that balance also, that's balanced growth, I mean, that balance implies not only that everything's growing exponentially at the same rate, but that protein synthesis consumption of amino acids is balanced by protein synthesis supply of amino acids. Let me pause. That was a whirlwind sort of recap of what we did last, last Friday. Is that better? All right. Okay, so this is going to feed into a larger point that I want to make, which is um, the exams on Friday, if you're worried about that, in the lecture notes, in the course notes, the typed stuff, there are practice problems at the end. Give them a try and see how you feel about them. Those would be good practice. And then on Thursday, uh, I'll check the schedule. I don't know what's a good time for you guys, but I can have office hours. I can just be in the TV room and we can have a, like a you know, tutorial session if you like, for as long as we need it. Okay, so if this doesn't make sense, think about it and then come and talk to me maybe at the break and then definitely let's talk about it on Thursday sometime. I, th I think that fits your schedule. We'll see. Okay, if not, we'll pick a better time. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, so let me tell you about it. So I thought maybe 10 multiple choice and then five short answer where like, you, by short answer I just mean write out the mathematics. Don't give me the whole derivation, just do that on rough paper. Just give me the answer. So I've got a little rectangle, you write your answer in it. <clears throat> it's like that so I can mark it quickly. <laughs> All right, so, but it's going to be mostly multiple choice. No, I, and I don't want it to be tricky. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't want it to be tricky. I'm not going to give you any weird, uh, I don't know how, how to tell you. I mean, I don't want, I don't want, I want you to do well on the exam. <laughs> right? But I also would, would like it if you retain some of the material. But uh, so those are the two things that are coming together for that. Yeah. This guy, this guy, uh, at the beginning, it was a theoretical constraint that linked this plot to this plot, but it turns out subsequently that it's an empirical constraint. I don't think I mentioned that on Friday. So since this work was done, 
we've done a lot of proteomic uh, experiments where you actually go in and count the abundance of different proteins. And this is, this is not really a hypothesis. It's an empirical constraint now. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the dynamic range of the R proteins here. And so this is telling you how much the R, the growth rate dependent R part can swing. And it's about 50%, 45%. Uh, and that's, that's empirical now. And mostly growth rate independent. So for the growth rates that we're talking about, it's growth rate independent-ish. But if you go to very slow growth rates, then what you find is that this part shrinks up. But that's, that's sort of a second order uh, constraint compared to what we're talking about here. So for the, for the sort of first order to first order, this thing is constant, growth rate independent, and it's given by this dynamic range, which is phi r min, uh, the difference between phi r max and phi r min. Any other questions about this? Phi R can be zero, yeah. Well, if phi R can go down to phi R min, in which case this whole piece of pi is zero. But that's a theoretical limit because that means there's no protein synthesis and no growth. And so this comes in back to the electrical circuits, which is that, I mean, with electrical circuits, you can short it out or you can make an open circuit. For these, you can't. So a short circuit would mean infinitely fast reaction rates, which we can't have. And then an a, a, um, open circuit is dead, and which we also is not experimentally accessible. So we do, or we have to do interpolations and extrapolations, basically. But you're right. The extrapolation here would be to phi r min, in which case metabolic proteins would be the whole of the pi, and we'd have zero growth. Does that make sense? So we'd be putting all our resources into scavenging nutrients, and we wouldn't have any resources for turning those into proteins. And that's what we mean by a terrible growth environment. Is that okay? Okay. Any other questions? Is that okay? It's okay. Okay. So then, so then, the other question that I had at the before the lecture was, um, what does any of this have to do with the electrical circuits? Um, and my motivation with the electrical circuit analogy was to show you that these two linear empirical relationships and this proteomic constraint, so basically the, this whole line, is mathematically identical to Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's loop law. So two resistors in series. Uh, and the reason I did that was twofold. One, it gives you a little bit of a computational edge if you want to do a, sort of a complicated computation like co-utilization of carbon. Why you would want to do that is, is was sort of as a, I mean, I don't know individually if anyone would ever want to do that. But that was an example of how the circuit analogy is helpful. The other side of the, the my motivation there was to show you at what level we're dealing with here. So here we're dealing with exactly the level that electronics were at uh, in about 1870. So we've got Empirical constraints, Ohm's law. We've got hypothetical constraints or just rules of operation, Kirchhoff's loop laws. And we don't really care or know about the underlying mechanisms. We have no quantum mechanics. We don't really know about, well, we sort of know about conservation of energy. But we're using these things, and we still use these, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's loop laws, constructively for rapid computation of complex problems. Right? For some kinds of questions, you don't need quantum mechanics. And electrical engineers don't really care. Well, don't really use it that often, right? depending upon the types of questions they're asking. And so what I'm suggesting, or what I meant to suggest at the end of last week's lecture, is that for certain types of questions, we don't need to know all the mechanisms and all the molecular details, which, to my mind, is... I'm grateful for because these huge wiring diagrams of this protein interacting with that protein can just become overwhelming. And so 
what I wanted to do is draw your attention to this coarse graining approach that allows us to answer questions at a different level. Um, but let me come back to that. Who asked me about the electrical circuit? You did. Okay, come back to that. Yeah. That's fine. Um, uh, they say that in the second lecture, you mentioned an experiment that was made in, in uh, let's say, in a DNA replication and uh, protein uh, replication in different nuclear uh, environments, where uh, there was, let's say, a certain level of carbon and uh, sugar, and etc. And we saw that, that the growth rate remains unchanged. Uh, probably this is the steady state situation, and this is not the steady state situation because. Can you can you remind me who is it? Is it Minode? Was that the first lecture? Yes. Is that the is that what you're referring to? Yes. Minode. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So this is not the, the steady state situation because we see that the growth rate here depends on the nutrient quality, right? Yeah. Um, let me address that. Uh, any? Can I erase this? Sure. Does anyone have any questions about what I have written on the board? No? Okay. Let me talk about So that's loose end. Let's talk to loose end number two then will be Minode, and loose end number three will be the electrical circuits. All right. Loose end number two. All right. So uh, Minode, Minode happened very early in the lecture series where we didn't, I mean, it's useful to go back and see what we were talking about. So I don't think that that expression that we had will make sense or made sense then. Now I think in retrospect it will make more sense. And this is what Minode found. I think this is what you're talking about, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay, so that's different. So this is Minode's relation. Does anyone have any questions about that? So this lambda max, so this is what I thought your question was. This lambda max will depend upon what the substrate is. Yeah, this is clear. Apologies. All right, so this one is the, uh, the MOLA experiment. So here we had square, here we had circle. They're very different. So chemically very different. All right, so one of them has, I don't know, like, like she said, and more, like I said at the time, maybe has some given carbon source like glucose and then some nitrogen source like alanine. The other one has some other carbon source, glycerol, and some other nitrogen source, ammonium. So they're very different chemically. So a chemist would run these through a spectrophotometer or, or, or an atomic absorption uh, spectrophotometer and say, these are very different. But what I'm saying is arrange these so that biologically, the, the E. coli in either one of these flasks will double once an hour. Once per hour. So I'm saying, you know, chemistry aside, the biological fact is that if you put E. coli into either one of these flasks and grow them up, they'll be doubling once per hour. And now I think a naive, I mean, not naive, a totally reasonable thing to think is that because the chemistry is so different in each of these flasks, the biology, I mean, irrespective of the fact that they double once every hour, has to also be very different. You need to turn on this protein or that protein, and there's very much a difference in what's going on mechanistically to process the nutrients in these two flasks. Uh, yeah, I mean, what would be an analogy? That's clear? That's okay, yeah? Okay, but now what I'm saying is, contrary to that expectation, they're indistinguishable, biologically indistinguishable cells, yeah? So what you then look at, for example, is mass per cell. When we say that they are indistinguishable, they say that the growth rate remains, uh, is unchanged, right? The, the growth rate is once per hour, yes. say. So that's, that's a steady state growth rate. But by indistinguishable, I mean that if you took these cells out, 
and you measured their size, or you looked at them under the microscope, they would look the same, which maybe is not too surprising. But now you break them open and you count the RNA per cell, it's the same. DNA per cell, it's the same. Uh, protein per cell, same. So by, by any large scale measure, they're indistinguishable. So if I, took, you know, if I took some of these cells and I put them in a microscope and I gave you all the chemical breakdown at the level of DNA, RNA, protein, you wouldn't be able to tell me which flask they came out of. Is that okay? Does that make better sense? Exactly. I mean, I think that's exactly the way to think of it, that the, the chemical composition of these cells is predominantly determined by the growth rate. So however you get there doesn't seem to matter all that much. And so here, what are we doing? Here, say square and circle would be right on top of each other. So if I, and so as I say, if I took one, you wouldn't be able to tell which, which flask it was grown in. Does that make sense? Does that make better sense? Do you know what I'm saying? So it is still balanced growth. What it's saying is that, it, more or less, what it's saying is that the biology is very different from the chemistry. So if I give you these two flasks, you could, or if I give you a little bit of this, the flask water, as a chemist, you could tell me which flask it came out of. If I gave you a little bit of the bacteria, as a biologist, you couldn't tell me which flask it came out of unless you measured something more detailed than mass per cell, RNA per cell, DNA per cell, and so on. That's an important point. That underlies basically most of what we've done. So the idea is that the growth rate is a macro variable and everything is or seems to be a slave to that, but in very simple ways like these empirical constraints. Any other, is that better? This? Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. So, it, so in that formalism, these two guys would have the same kappa n. Even though they have different chemistry, these would have what we call, we would say, same kappa n. That's a connection. Okay, so, so kappa n isn't a unique feature of the chemistry. No, I feel like I, I feel like you're unhappy with that. No, is that okay? No. <coughs> Let me know if it's not satisfactory in a second. Any other any other questions? Well, she. I'll, I'll let them talk it out. It's okay? Yeah? What do you think? In this scenario, when they have the same uh, growth and rate, that means, or what we just saw, that they have the same case, uh, kappa n of the square times uh, pi p of the square is equal to kappa n of the circle times pi p of the circle, the product. Yeah, exactly. So since they also are biologically the same, that also means that That's right. Because but they're um, producing pro protein at the same rate. Also. Yes, exactly. So now here's a, what's important. That 5p is a mass fraction. So micrograms of p protein per total protein. But the makeup of those proteins are different. So the mass is the same, sure. But they're diff very different proteins that are, yeah? Does that help mix it together? Yeah. Okay, so let me keep going with his thought because it's very good. So IE. This phi p square is equal to phi p circle. That is to say the micrograms of non-ribosomal proteins or milligrams of metabolic proteins per milligrams of total protein Those are the same, so the weight, the weight of the protein. 
the identity of the proteins is very different. Well, not very, very different, but is different. Okay, so let me pause. This implies this, which implies this. Does that, is that chain of inference reasonable? Now let's go into interpretation. Interpretation is, but the identity of these metabolic proteins is not the same. It's not necessarily the same. The identity of individual metabolic proteins is not the same. So this guy might have some certain enzymes that are on to chew up that carbon source. This guy might have different enzymes that are turned on to chew up this other carbon source. But then when, you, when it all shakes out, the mass of those proteins is the same. Or the mass fraction of those proteins is the same. Which is odd, I think. <laughs> But it's a consequence of, of, of what we've seen. The fact that these, that the doubling rate almost 100% determines the macromolecular composition is what leads to this. Is that better? Is that a better? OK. So, so um, are you guys OK? Is that OK? Did you guys rectify it? It did? Oh, great. OK. All right. Any other questions? Think about it. Let me know if anything feels uncomfortable. I mean, not you know, that just sort of isn't sitting well with you. Um, I'll do I'll do one more example. So, what time do we start? Ten. Oh, all right. So, I'll do one example, and then you know, let it stew, and then we'll have a break, and then we'll come back and uh, and do another set of examples. But I think the set of example, or the first example that I want to do, is a nice sort of warm up to what, well, what we're going to do next, but also what we did previously. So warm down, I guess. All right. Any questions of this, about any of this, before I erase it? All right, so that was loose end number two. Let's go to uh, the first consequence that I want to talk about, which then ties into loose end number three. So um, let me draw it, and then let's talk about it. So here was the um, this this uh, electrical circuit analogy was that there's some fixed proteome fraction that's available to us to to uh, um, drive protein synthesis and to supply amino acids. And that guy is phi max. And then we can think of those two empirical relationships, well, that are buried inside those straight lines over there, as two resistors in series, one with a uh, resistance, one over kappa T. So kappa T is a conductivity of the resistor, and one over kappa N. And then we had this uh, potential drop which is phi p, which I, I call delta phi p because I, I wanted to, um, to, to dry your, or maybe make the suggestion that it's like a drop across the resistor. Up here we had delta phi r, which is the, the protein fraction, but also in this analogy, the voltage drop, which was equal to phi r minus phi r min. So here I'm just thinking of the growth rate dependent part. And then this phi max was equal to uh, phi r max minus phi r min. There we are. Okay, so that was the scenario and that was the connection between this 
this voltage analogy or this, this electrical circuit analogy and those constraints that we had previously. Um, before we talk about the first consequence, so we looked already at one set of consequences, which was what if we had co-utilization of carbon sources and we assume that they use totally different proteins, some set of proteins to chew up that carbon source and some set of proteins to chew up that carbon source. Well, what we could do is imagine that as parallel resistors. And then we can characterize the rest of the circuit having shorted out those two resistors. And then individually with one resistor and then the other resistor. And then that would give us a, an expression for this, the circuit with these two resistors in parallel. So that's to say that we could look at the individual carbon sources and then bring that information together to get an expression for the co-utilized carbon sources. And what we saw, well, what I suggested with a cartoon drawing was that the experiments agree very well with that idea, with that conception, giving us at least some credibility to, to uh, this picture. Okay, but what I want to talk about now is an even simpler example, which is what if we make a protein that the cell can't use for growth, like insulin, for example, but we can just force a cell to make a protein by engineering it into its DNA that it can't possibly use for growth. It's not, it doesn't serve any metabolic function. It doesn't aid protein synthesis at all. It simply uses up available resources and ribosomes for its own ends and causes a growth defect. What would that look like in this picture? So that's what I want to talk about now. But before I do that, there were questions. Did you want to ask, do, do, do you have any questions about this guy specifically? Okay. Um, Maybe it's better, we'll, we'll work, we should talk one-on-one -on -one then. We'll, we'll go through it, one-on-one. -on -one. Are there any questions though about this electrical circuit analogy? So my hope with this is that it would, it would act as a secondary analogy that would make some of the ideas a little bit more uh, memorable or clear. If it didn't serve that purpose, ignore it. I mean, it's just another way to write the same set of constraints. So if it's not, um, what do you call it? Well, if it's not useful, just ignore it. Okay, I don't know if that made people happier or less happy. Okay, so the, the uh, first example that I want to look at, so what I want to look at now is um, I want to use these constraints to explore the coupling between uh, protein expression and growth rate. So protein, when I say protein expression, I mean synthesis of a particular protein and a growth rate. So we've looked at the, the not the converse, but the maybe the inverse of that. We've looked at how growth rate, growth rate affects some unregulated protein. Now I want to ask a different question. If I make a particular protein, what can I expect as an outcome on the growth rate? And I think the easiest thing to imagine is a protein that doesn't help growth. <laughs> it's just a burden. So the first example is going to be useless protein uh, synthesis. So here I, I'm going to denote by phi u the mass fraction. So this is milligrams of useless protein per milligrams of total protein. And by useless, I mean not necessarily useless to us as humans, but definitely useless for the bacterium in the sense that it does not contribute to the uh, growth of the bacterium. 
It serves no metabolic function. It serves no protein synthetic function. It's just made because we want it made and not because the bacterium would ever want it made. Growth of the bacterium. And the first, uh, the first example of this, I mean, historically, was people using E. coli to produce insulin. And you can imagine insulin, which is what we use to treat diabetes in humans, has absolutely no purpose in bacterium. <laughs> it's just made. It's a protein. Sure, it's made out of amino acids, sure. But it doesn't help the bacterium in any way. Now, the question that I want to ask is, how does the growth rate depend on this fraction of useless protein? So, how does growth rate depend upon this useless protein fraction? I.e., what's this expression? If I tell you that I'm making 30% of my proteome as useless protein, can you then tell me what the, what the growth rate of my bacterium is? Okay, that's the type of question I want to ask. Let me pause. Though. Before we get to the analytic the expression and things like that, um, uh, we'll come back to this. But is the scenario, com does, it, does everybody see the scenario that I'm talking about here? By, does the term useless protein, you see what I mean by that? So it does, not, it does not increase growth rate. It can only decrease growth rate. Or keep it the same. We don't know yet. Yeah? Yes, you'd think, right? And so if all that was growth limiting was the replication rate of the DNA, of then yes, then the only burden would be the small, say, seconds it would take or milliseconds it would take to reproduce that piece of DNA. So assuming that it, uh, all, uh, like it doesn't experience any perturbation in terms of the machinery required to produce this, this it looks like alien protein. Yeah. So you don't really know how is the TRNA pool like, yeah. uh, and all the other things. But yeah. assuming that they're already there, and uh, like it's just a variation in what protein you're making, but not really like you know, yeah. something genuinely very different from which you already made. You would expect that you know it's just an equal and slightly larger DNA. Yeah, that's a good. I mean, then what would you think about this lambda? Then this is then the it would be this, I guess. No, no, it's not. It's a slightly larger uh, DNA. So I would say, uh, well, the growth rate will be pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So his, his suggestion, I think, is a perfectly reasonable suggestion, is that the only growth defect is going to be associated with the time it takes to reproduce the, the uh, chromosome. And here's something weird about that, is that if you make the chromosome bigger, you just put junk in, or you, let's talk about it like that. So say you just put in junk that is not made into protein, it's just junk DNA bases that are replicated but never transcribed, the growth rate doesn't change. And the reason it doesn't change is because the cell, to compensate for that, just initiates its fork of replication earlier than it normally would. So the age of initiation shifts, but the growth rate doesn't. So for some weird, well, I'm making it sound weirder than it is, the DNA replication dynamics and the growth are intrinsically uncoupled, which is weird. Okay. So your suggestion is valid and, and is, it would even be true no matter how long a piece of DNA you yeah, stuck in. I wouldn't say that because there are other concerns like volume concerns. And, uh, okay. And yeah. like prokaryotic cell probably is already at the brink of being crowded. Yeah, but then it'll just make itself bigger. Yeah. I mean. I mean, I don't know whether the whole cell itself is very distant. I mean, like, yeah. I can't just, like, yeah, well, yeah, okay. I mean, there's probably, there's going to be a limit. But. The, in terms of the, say, the density inside, some, some folks would argue that the volume fraction is growth limiting, but then there's, there, there may be other growth limiting factors that we can get our hands on, which I'll show you in a second. Any other questions or suggestions? Yeah. 
No. Add something extra, extra that wouldn't um, make your your dish more crowded. Oh, your E. coli. So what happens? I should tell you. This is this is uh, um, this is outside of of the constraints, but it's an empirical uh, observation that I'll tell you about. If you do make this useless protein, the cells swell. So they just get bigger. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't need to make sense. What I mean is what I said is what I said sensible. So it's not, so they're not constrained by volume. They keep their density the same. And so to compensate for this useless protein, they're, they're bigger for whatever reason. The mechanisms on them. All right. Now my question to you is, how does this pie chart change if you start to ram in a wedge of useless protein? And then what effect does that have on the growth rate? So how can we model this? And there are two complementary ways. So how, how can we, how can we, I don't want to say model, but yeah, let's say model. Model this. And so there are two ways. One is, like I suggested just now, we can ram a wedge into this pie chart. Or, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Or this is some uh, variable resistor. Or we can make this electrical circuit analogy. We can think of a, a voltage drop external to the, to the original circuit where we force some potential drop across this resistor by fiddling with it, which is equal to this phi u. Okay, and so as I make more phi u, what do I get? I don't know if I, I, I'm not so artistic. All right, as I make more and more and more phi u, and I can do that by changing the DNA, making it more and more transcribed or translated. The point is that what I'm allowed to read out is this phi u and the growth rate. So remember the growth rate is a current through here. And now I want to plot these things. What should I see? So here's growth rate. And here is uh, useless protein. And suppose I start here. So this is my growth rate with no useless protein. And then either I have a system where I can add a chemical that increases the amount of this useless protein, or I have just a bunch of different E. coli with different pieces of DNA jammed in that make different amounts of useless protein. And I now measure the growth rate along the vertical and this useless protein along the horizontal, what should I see? Monotonically decreasing. Okay. Monotonic decreasing. All right, more and more. So you drew it with your hand. What, what, why did you draw it like that? Okay, but... It, it, can, can anybody say anything more than monotonicity? 
because uh, because uh, if the size of the DNA would be the only constraint. Oh, the size of the DNA is no constraint. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So that means ribosomes, that yeah. means RNA. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, DRNA, everything. Yeah. So, so I would say it's a higher polynomial. All right, OK. So remember that we had, um, for this circuit, but also with the combination of these phenomenological um, laws, when we brought them together, we had this expression. Where this thing was uh, phi r max minus phi r min, which was this uh, battery here. Now, suppose you start making this phi u. What can you say about that voltage drop? Exactly. So with useless protein, this is the sort of the first order suggestion is that you would have this. You don't change the translation rate per ribosome, possibly. Possibly you do, but to first approximation, you say, what, what, what does this useless protein have to do with translation? What does it have to do with nutrient assimilation? Nothing. What it does do is take away resources that would otherwise be occupied making proteins, i.e. ribosomes, or supplying amino acids. OK? And so then, if I if I pull this apart, so let me write this as uh, so now I have phi max minus phi max over phi max phi u over all of this stuff. I'm going to, I can rewrite that. I'll just um, pull everything out, and I will have phi max over 1 over kappa t plus 1 over kappa n, 1 minus phi u over phi max. Did I do that right? Does everybody believe that? Yeah? All right, then this is my growth rate when phi, z, phi u is zero. So this is my, my uh, say, you know, nominal growth rate. So what can you tell me then about what you would expect for this growth rate? Linear. So the idea is, or the, the sort of the naive, sort of kind of parameter-free estimate would be that you get a linear decrease. And then what's this uh, intercept? Vmax. And now if I take a different growth rate, so say I'm now growing in a, in a different growth nutrient environment, what, what's your expectation then? Well, I mean, uh, okay. I would definitely say that the intercept will be equal to max because uh, you're missing out on DNA, which probably will code for things like DNA and all those things which are, re which are required to make the whole thing happen. Oh, yes, yeah, so you're not replacing I those. Go push this back limit, oh, to here. Experimentally? Is that what you mean? Yeah, no, your experiments. 
oh, no, 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 wait, wait, no, no, this is not, this is not DNA, this is just a protein it makes. So the DNA that encodes for this protein may only be, say, Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. It's a it's a genetically engineered E. coli. But so but so was so was this one, the one that I used for this experiment. So there, I put in a piece of DNA that had a, a synthetic promoter that was making a enzyme that I could read out. So this one is as non E. coli species as this one is. It's, it's true, technically it's not, but I'm, I mean, the, the amount of difference is, is insignificant. <laughs> no, you're unhappy. We, we should talk about it, but phys, phys, physiolo, physiologically, they're the same uh, bacterium. Okay, so it's true, genetically, there is a difference of about a thousand bases. No, what, what I mean is... Yeah. Yeah. That's what I know. Yeah. It's like tinkering the genetic material itself. Yes, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so the point is you are replacing a good portion of what E. coli is. So the percentage of uh, DNA which belongs to the wild type E. coli yeah. is decreasing every time you produce more and more protein that E. coli doesn't produce. No, no, no. Uh, you only insert one set of instructions. It's about a thousand bases long. And then that, that will take you all the way along this curve by just adding different, uh, what they call inducers, which turn on that, make the transcription so rate you higher. You make only the, the, you, make the e, you make sure that E. coli only produces, transcri you know, uh, transcripts only that part of the DNA. No, well, you, you are able to chemically amplify the amount of transcripts that come off that piece of DNA. And that piece of DNA sort of is, is, is jammed into a place where so it's like you've got the regular DNA, of the, then you cut it open, but this break point is not, it isn't in the middle of a gene, for example. It's, it's usually at a place where, uh, oh, it doesn't matter, it's a phage insertion site, so it's, it's non-damaging, that part. You could insert junk DNA and it would have no effect on the growth rate. It's so, so, okay? So, so you're saying that you can go on the, uh, go across the, uh, the Exactly, makes a lot of protein. Okay, so getting down here is quite tricky because the cell, of course, really resents having to make half of its proteome garbage. And it will fight. I mean, there's, it's under huge selective pressure to lose that piece of DNA. All right, but if, if, if we're able to, all of that sort of evolutionary stuff aside, where am I here? <laughs> We've got this, so now if I start growing it in a, at a slower, in a medium that supports slower growth rate, what do you think about the intercept? Uh, by, by that it shouldn't matter. Yeah, exactly. By that it shouldn't matter. All right, so no matter what your nominal growth rate is, they should all converge to the same intercept, and this intercept is, like I say, the difference between this intercept and that intercept in the phi r plot. That, that's the self-consistent picture. Now whether or not that's true, we have to look at experiments, okay? But conceptually, is everyone on board with me conceptually? See what I'm saying? So, I'm not tall enough to take advantage of this, but this was our first experiment, Neidhart and Magasanic. And then we started doing all these acrobatics in terms of proteome partitioning and we end up with this situation when we say, okay, if you believe this proteome partitioning picture, then production of a useless protein should result in a linear decrease with an intercept that agrees with this Neidhart and Magasanic picture. Whether or not that's true, we need to investigate. So far, so good? Okay, I'll show you the data and then let's take a break. And so the right-hand side is the data and different colors or different growth rates corresponding to the dots over here. 
And the straight lines are not best line fits, as you can see. <laughs> they are using that phi max that you get from the left-hand panel and making a completely parameter-free guess like we did here. And I hope you can see it's not bad. So I'm looking now at the top, yeah, the top panel here. This top panel is meant to be this guess. And again, the straight lines are not best fits. They're just, all right, I know phi max more or less. And you can see it doesn't do a bad job. We do see a more or less monotonic decrease with growth rate. And they are more or less linear. Okay, it's hard to tell once you start to get to very high fractions of the proteome. So this is 30% of the proteome, or 30% of the protein in the cell is garbage. Um, and the cells really resent that, like I say. And they're under tremendous selective pressure to not do that. And so this is not a really sustainable situation. They quickly evolve to not do this. But anyway, we can then go back into the literature and look at other people who've done a similar experiment and plot their results. And again, so where's the, the intercept? The just pure guess would be about here. And you can see it's not terrible. Right, so these are very different proteins being made by very different systems, all in E. coli. But they all have this feature that the decrease is, yes, monotonic with growth rate, but more or less linear. And so at best, when you make a garbage protein, you can expect a linear decrease. But if there's any additional toxicity of that protein, it's going to be more than linear. So you'll get some kind of higher order terms. But at best, you can't escape this. Does that make sense? This is like the Carnot cycle. This is your maximum efficiency, if you like. You can't ever expect less of a growth burden than this, based on this whole proteome partitioning picture. Okay? So let me say that really quickly, and then let's break. So, so I'll say it in words. I, I've run out of chalk. So, okay, so the idea is, this is the best you can do. And probably reality is going to be somewhere down here, or especially at high production rates. Okay, but let me come back to any questions about this, this, um, what would you call it? This set of ideas, this consequence of this proteome picture? Anyone have any questions about the relationship between this pie chart and this electrical circuit? Another way to think of it is that this overexpressed or useless protein is just like taking a battery and putting it, flipping it around and jamming it into your circuit. So it's, you know, it's a negative voltage drop, if you like. It's sucking up potential from this battery, which would be otherwise used for good, into just garbage, fittering it away. All right? I think the, I mean, this takes some thinking. This one is, is sort of inevitable. You just jam in another wedge. OK, these wedges have to get smaller. But we already said that the growth rate is proportional to the area of these wedges. Right? It's proportional to um, kappa t times delta phi r, which is equal to kappa n delta phi p. And so if you make these guys smaller, you necessarily make the growth rate smaller. OK, let me pause, though. Any questions about any of that? Okay, think about it. Let it stew. And let's, uh, maybe let's break till 1230. It's OK. All right, I'll see you guys shortly. Mm -hmm.
All right. So uh, let me come back then. So the, the, the suggestion is that if this protein is useless but non-toxic, the best you can hope for is this linear decrease in growth rate. Because making a useless protein necessarily squeezes out useful protein. And we have this constraint that the sum of the fractions of useless and useful is equal to some fixed number, 0 0.5 as the case may be. Okay? So the more of this you make, or force the cell to make, the less it can make of these, and consequently, the slower it will grow. Does that make sense to everybody? And again, this is an ideal situation. At best, you can hope for a linear decrease. In reality, it's likely that you'll see a much more acute growth rate change, something like maybe like that, especially at very low growth rates where the cell is more or less breaking to pieces. All right? Okay. So, but again, this is very much like in thermodynamics where we have these, these estimates of perfect efficiency of heat engines or something like that. Okay, this is the best we can hope for from an E. coli. Let me pause. Any questions about that? And we get it for free, right? We, I mean, we got it from the, from the mag, Neidhart Magasanic plots, basically. Okay, let me pause. Is the conception okay? All right. So now I want to go even more, I think, uh, sort of to a higher level of self-consistency. So what we initially talked about was this, this connection, that as we change the growth rate, we change the expression of different kinds of proteins, ribosome, ribosome associated proteins, metabolic proteins, and so on. We just now saw the case where, forget about this, what if we force it to make a particular protein? How does that feed back on the growth rate? Okay, how does that change the growth rate? Now I want to bring both of them together. And so now I'm not thinking of a protein that is neutral, i.e. doesn't affect the growth rate. I mean, that doesn't, isn't in and of itself toxic or beneficial. I'm thinking of a protein that specifically changes the growth rate. So what happens if the protein uh, I am making is not, uh, you know, neutral, useless, but rather itself affects growth rate. And I think perhaps one of the simplest uh, examples would be a protein that confers antibiotic resistance. Okay, I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so now what I'm thinking in contrast to the picture that I showed you earlier was not some passive wedge that just takes up space in our pie chart, but something now that we need to be more, we need to think more about where this affects this and this affects that. And then we ask, what's going to be the end result? Okay? Well, and I'll be more specific as we go, obviously. Okay, so let me tell you what I mean by this antibiotic resistance. And then let's talk about, oh good, okay, you guys have the, I see the attendance sheet being passed around because I forget it every single time. Uh, antibiotic resistance. Okay, so, And this will be useful again on tomorrow's lecture when we talk about this particular set of antibiotics. But imagine an antibiotic that targets the ribosome. Or let's say targets protein synthesis. Okay, and so Here's my antibiotic, and then here is my ribosome. And what I'm imagining is that this antibiotic, either reversibly or irreversibly, I don't really care at this stage, 
binds to my ribosome and renders it uh, non non functioning. Okay, so that's the scenario that I'm going to talk about more tomorrow. But now I'm imagining that in addition to this antibiotic mode of action, we have a protein being made by the cell that destroys this antibiotic. So this is the antibiotic mode of action. And then on top of that, I'm imagining a cell that has some resistance to this antibiotic in the form of some protein. So here I've got some protein X, which is a resistance protein. Here I've got the antibiotic. And now here, I'm not, I, I don't really care what the mode of resistance is. And there are, there are typically two big groups. One, where the protein in question pumps the antibiotic out of the cell. Or another group that just chemically breaks the antibiotic. Okay, and so here what I'm imagining is something, this is now an uh, ineffective antibiotic. And then usually this X is just recycled. So usually X is an enzyme that, that chemically modifies the antibiotic so that it's useless. Okay? Does everybody see this scenario if I didn't make any spelling mistakes? So this is the mode of resistance. All right. So, so far, so good. So I have an antibiotic that I'm adding as a human. I have a protein that the bacterium is making to try and fight me, <laughs> to thwart my efforts. And now I want to ask, how is this protein related to the growth rate of the bacterium? <clears throat> okay. And on the face of it, this is not a difficult question. But I, I want to show you that there's something subtle going on here. All right, but does everybody uh, feel comfortable with the scenario that I've just drawn? It's okay. So we can characterize these reactions, what's called uh, in vitro. That's to say we can do it on a chemistry bench. And if I look at all the players here, so I've got uh, resistance protein, X, uh, I've got the antibiotic, um, I have the translation rate, kappa T, and I have the growth rate, lambda. So these are the major players that I want to call your attention to. And the interaction among all these players we know. So for example, this translation rate has a positive correlation with growth rate because the growth rate is this phi max 1 over kappa t plus 1 over kappa n. If you make this translation rate higher, the cells grow faster. If you make it lower, they grow slower. Of course, there's a maximum, which is when there's no antibiotic, they're growing as fast as possible. The kt is as high as possible. But if you make this KT, this translation rate, smaller, they will grow slower. Does that make sense? And so I'm going to use this pointy arrow to denote a positive correlation, which means if this goes up, this goes up. Or if this goes down, this goes down. I'm really bringing this point because I'm going to start adding connections, and I don't want the logic to get lost. Is that sensible? In control engineering, these types of interaction diagrams are, are, are fairly ubiquitous, but they may not have, you may not have come across them. So we'll take them slowly. Um, here, what do you expect? A positive or a negative correlation? 
Negative. All right. So what I'm going to do is put a blunt arrow. This means negative. And if you want, if you want some analytic scenario here, you could think of kt being equal to some kt max, and then one plus the antibiotic concentration. Okay. So the more of this antibiotic you have, the smaller the translation rate. And this KD is just some, some uh, non-dimensionalizing parameter that tells you how sensitive your, your bacterium is to that antibiotic. And you could, you could run this experiment in a test tube. You've got a bunch of ribosomes, you've got a bunch of antibiotic, and you just measure chemically how strongly they interact with one another. Okay? That's, the, that's what you do in the chemistry lab. This is just by definition. The antibiotic, the higher you make it, the smaller the translation rate. That's how this antibiotic works. All right. And then here, of course, we have a positive interaction. Or sorry, a negative interaction. <laughs> so the more of this resistance protein you have, the less of this antibiotic you have. And so if you want a uh, uh, sort of an analytic description of that, maybe something like this A is equal to some a external divided by 1 plus some, let's call it alpha x to the squared, say. And so A external is the amount of antibiotic outside of my cell. And so this protein either chews up the antibiotic or it pumps it out. I don't really care. Either way, the more of this I have, the less antibiotic I have inside my cell. All right. So far, so good. And now if we look at this interaction map, it's not surprising. You have two negatives make a positive, And so you end up with an overall positive interaction. The more of this x you have, the faster you grow. Not at all surprising. All right? Let me draw it. So. I have this uh, growth rate. Leave some space here. Growth rate. And here I'm going to normalize it by the, by the antibiotic free growth rate. There's one. Here's zero. Okay, and then this is going to be the efficacy or the efficiency of the resistance. In units, you know, again, this alpha is just a dimensional, non-dimensionalizing parameter that tells you how good your protein is. If it's very good at its job, then you don't need much of it to get rid of a lot of a, a antibiotic. If it's very bad at its job, then you need lots of it to get the same effect. But in either case, alpha times x has no dimensions, and it's a measure of how good my protein is or how much of the protein I need. Okay? And based on that wiring diagram that I have there, we'll see something like this. Does that make sense? I promise you there's something strange is going to happen in a minute. This should be sort of self-evident, and you should maybe be saying to yourself, what, um, why are you even bothering with this? Uh, I will draw your attention to, to two more things. One is, this is what we call the phenotype, or the outcome, the observable characteristics. So this is what's sometimes called a phenotype. That is to say, what we observe in a bacterium, how fast it grows. And this is what we call a genotype. This we can change by fiddling with the DNA. So this is now what's called a genotype. And if you're thinking about, uh, about evolution, then what you're thinking about in this scenario is the slope of this line. 
So the slope here tells you how much of a difference a small genetic change is going to make. So this is the, if you like, the, the fitness advantage of a mutation. It's saying a small change in the DNA, if that slope is steep, a small change in the DNA gives you a big change in the growth rate. And so if you're, if you're thinking about modeling antibiotic resistance and evolution and things like that, you would try to make it so that this slope was as shallow as possible. So that you can get, you would take many, 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 many mutations before you had any appreciable change in the growth rate. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? All right, what's missing? <laughs> so this is what I would call open loop. You say, and this guy goes to this guy, goes to this guy, goes to this guy. But there's something missing. We know that this guy changes this guy. So imagine now that this resistance protein just arose in the cell. There's no, there's no particular regulation that's involved here. It's just a, a protein that maybe was doing something else, but now is being used as a antibiotic resistance. It's got no regulation. So suppose this guy is unregulated, or as we called it before, constitutive. This is the simple, simplest possible scenario. And if we're thinking evolutionarily, that would be where everything started, with an unregulated protein. Having said that then, this missing link along the left vertical side what should its logic be, positive or negative? Right. Let's go back. So while you think about it, let me go previous. There we go. OK, so, so this link here, positive, positive or negative? Positive. positive. Who, says, who says positive? Who says positive and why? Why do you say positive? Because Anybody? Okay, I was going to give you. Okay, but you guys would say positive. Why do you say positive? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Well, where on this diagram are you looking? If you're going to look at this diagram, this one is the constitutive proteins. Which lines would you be looking at? The black or the sorry, the kind of the pink line? No. OK. The, the invisible line that goes like this, or the uh, colored lines? And why? So think of it that way, and then I'll come back to you then. Why do you say negative? OK, OK. So that is sort of under OK, so, that's, so you're thinking two steps ahead. So then, so then empirically, though, what, do you, what, what does this picture suggest? Positive or negative correlation, and why? Anybody? Is, it, is my question answerable? I mean, does it make sense, is what I mean? Positive. Positive. You say positive, why? Exactly. So he's looking here along a colored line, which says that, and why he's doing that is because we're in, we're in a situation where we have translational inhibition. We have an antibiotic acting, which is these numbers. So we are at, for example, eight. And now we say, what happens if the growth rate goes up? If the growth rate goes up, this protein abundance also goes up. This line has positive slope under those conditions. So. Under conditions of, let me write that out and let's talk about it because it's important. Both points are important. So his point and that point over there. So here, under conditions of translational inhibition, this growth rate 
is positively correlated with x. That's not to say that x uh, necessarily, well, it does in this case. <laughs> x is going to increase the growth rate. But it also means that when the growth rate increases, x increases necessarily. Does everybody see that? So that if we relieve some of that translational inhibition, well, then we start to make more constitutive proteins, which means we make more x, which means we relieve more of the antibiotic, which means we grow faster, which means we make more x, and so on. Before we get to that loop, that and so on, does everybody believe this line? This comes from the, the plot that we had where we had this phi p, we had growth rate, we had this, and then we had these dashed lines under uh, translational inhibition. Now the point here is that these dashed lines have positive slope. These dashed lines have positive slope. So far so good? Okay, so this guy was the open loop. This guy that I'm about to draw is a closed loop. So as was suggested, all right, pause here actually. Does everybody see why we need this, this vertical line? So two weeks ago, I would have said there's no need for it. But now that we've had this course, you see that it's inevitable. There has to be this other link. So this link is never included in these <laughs> mathematical models. But anyway, we know to include it. But then if you do, what happens? Well, then we have two negatives, make a positive, makes a positive, makes a positive. And we have what's called a positive feedback loop. And you've seen this. I mean, you've seen this when somebody's trying to speak. It, usually it's at a high school like gymnasium. And the speaker is picking up what the, or sorry, the microphone is picking up what the speaker's putting out. And so they say, all right, everybody. And then they say, oh, everybody gets confused and they unplug everything. So if you take a, a speaker and you point the microphone at the speaker, you get a positive feedback loop. You get production with amplification. And so just like that system, we have a danger of bistability, which is that this thing is quiet until someone coughs, and then suddenly it flips to the high feedback line. So we have two, two possible states, silence and maximal out of, the, out of the speaker. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? If you've never experienced it, at least hopefully you can imagine it. It's horrible, and it happens all the time. And it inevitably happens in high school. Um, all right, and so with a closed loop, we have a feedback system. And so now, instead of this uh, alpha x, we would just have this efficacy alpha beta. So again, it's efficacy. Again, we have the growth rate. But now, instead of this smooth, monotonically increasing curve, we can have situations like this. Where this is a regime of what's called bistability. Let me, let me put it out like this. which means that there are multiple fixed points in our system. A low growth rate, low uh, resistance, x point, and a high x, high growth rate point. Okay, so this in and of itself isn't terrible. It just means that we can expect uh, in a certain range of antibiotics and, and uh, efficacy of the resistance, subpopulations, some that are growing fast, some that are growing slow. So we have a heterogeneous distribution of growth rates in our population. What's horrible is right here, where we lose the heterogeneity. Now, instead of some slope, however steep it might be, we have an infinite slope. <laughs> a small, tiny change in the uh, DNA gives you an infinite advantage, an infinite selective advantage. You jump from some low growth rate to almost maximal growth rate. 
And so it turns out that a map like this versus a map like this, this type of map between your, your DNA and your growth rate facilitates evolution of resistance many, many more, you know, thousands of fold more than this type of view. And so if we bring in the physiology, we end up with this extra cooperativity which facilitates evolution. Okay, so that's one hand, w something I wanted to talk about. But on the other hand, whenever we talk about proteins changing growth rate, we need to remember that growth rate changes proteins. All right, and so what I want to talk about tomorrow then is more examples of this type of feedback. And then the case of antibiotics targeting ribosomes but without a resistance mechanism. Okay, but before I do that, are there any questions about this scenario? So I think the top curve is almost self-evident to the extent that someone might be resentful that I even put it up there. But the bottom curve is surprising. And it's surprising for the reasons that he suggested, that when you have a loop like this that reinforces itself, you can, at the beginning, have nothing, and then all of a sudden flip up to lots, saturation. Right? That's a feature of these positive feedback systems. Okay? And again, the feedback you would never see in the DNA of the organism. You could do all the chemistry in the world and you would never find this loop. This loop comes from the biology, from the physiology. It comes from remembering that these cells are growing. Right? All right, let me pause. Any questions? It's okay? All right, think about it and then let's talk about it uh, tomorrow then. All right, have a good lunch. <laughs>